Welcome to the UK Travel Planning Podcast. Your host is the founder of the UK Travel Planning website, Tracy Collins. In this podcast, Tracy shares destination guides, travel tips, and itinerary ideas, as well as interviews with a variety of guests who share their knowledge and experience of UK travel to help you plan your perfect UK vacation. Join us as we explore the UK from cosmopolitan cities to quaint villages, from historic castles to beautiful islands, and from the picturesque countryside to seaside towns. Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the UK Travel Planning Podcast. In this week's episode, I chat to mum of three, Deborah Blazer, about her family's whirlwind 12-day road trip of England and Scotland. Deborah started the podcast with a few questions for me before sharing the details of her trip, plus tips for those of you who are planning a UK road trip of your own. So without further ado, let's have a chat with Deborah. I know you want to ask me some questions, Deborah, so go for it. Yes. First of all, I'd like to know how you and Doug met yep. and did, did the podcast, was it something you formed together or was it something you started and he joined later or vice versa? How did that come about? Okay. Well, um, Doug and I have been married for, uh, I reckon nearly 20 years coming up. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I would say maybe, I don't know, 18, 19, something like that. I'm not very good at remembering. He'll, he'll probably, <laughs> he'll, he'll, and I usually forget the day as well, the date, because I wanted to get married on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, but, but <laughs> um, so that's, a, that's the date I always think about. So, so we, we met a long time ago and um, I've always traveled. Uh, that's always what I've done my entire life. So before I met Doug, um, I've, I've got a, a daughter, she's 27 now. So I traveled a lot with her as a single parent. Um, and then Doug and I met and I was like, you know, I love traveling. So bearing in mind, I was kind of um, mid thirties. So at that point, I'd done a lot of traveling. Doug hadn't. He'd previously been married and was divorced and hadn't really done a, a lot of traveling really outside of Europe, certainly not outside of Europe. So okay. he kind of got the travel bug from me it's you just you have to really I just love travel from a very young age I've been it's been kind of my total love and obsession and it, a lot of it is about the people that I meet because um I love visiting gorgeous places obviously around the world but, yes. but for me a lot of it is about the people that I meet along the way that that for me makes a destination so I am um, I have a, an insatiable uh, thirst for to find out about how other people living on this same planet as I am share what's their life like I kind of want to know yes how, how everybody lives their lives um so kind of so then to cut long story short because I could be on this podcast <laughs> all day um I started a, a website in 2016 called Tracy's Travels in Time okay basically just to write about my travels and what I was doing. Um, and that website still does really well. I'm actually going to be starting a, a new podcast, which um, will be about um, global travel planning. Oh, that's going to be coming out soon. I'm going to, I'm starting to put together episodes for that. And that basically is going to be me just sharing where we travel to, because obviously we, we have a love of the UK and um, a lot of knowledge about UK travel, which is why we have UK travel planning. Yes. But we also travel to a lot of des other destinations. And I kind of want to share how I planned those trips, uh, what we did, what we saw, who we met, and hopefully talk to people in the different destinations. So I'm off to New Zealand um, in a few weeks time. And then uh, we're going to Japan. Oh. Yeah, Japan in October. So I thought, well, you know what? Let's Fantastic. So jealous. So, so let's share a bit of that. Um, so, so that'll be coming up. So um, I started UK Travel Planning in 2020. I'd just come back from the UK and obviously then COVID hit and I was I was very keen to start a, a UK Travel Planning focused website, which is what, what I did first because I had the practice from doing Tracy's Travels in Time website. And then the podcast last year, I figured really that the website's fine, but, I, I, you know, to, to give a full of resource for people, Mm. not everybody wants to read um some people like to listen I know I like to listen I also like to watch videos so that's something I'm going to be hoping to get more into making YouTube videos I'm, I'm trying to it's just a matter of time right oh the podcast was invaluable to us well I would sit and work all day and I listen to Spotify I often listen to audiobooks yeah and I found your podcast and it was like finding gold uh, <laughs> you know what the the podcast I love doing the podcast because it, it also, you know, doing the website is one thing and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge resource we've put together, 
but I don't necessarily know who goes on my website. Well, I don't know who goes on the website and reads the stuff. But when I do a podcast, I kind of get my voice out there, but I get other people's voices out there. So obviously talking to you today, Deborah, you know, we can share your trip with people all around the world. And we have listeners on every continent. Yes. So people listen and they 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 want it. They listen to the advice. They take the the they want sort of the inspiration, but they want the practical tips, and that's what we're sharing. But also not only with myself and Doug doing the podcast, but also bringing in guests who are like specialists in different areas, like Sinead, who did the episode mm. three about York, and also because we obviously we're sharing a lot of our own travels uh, around the UK as well. So again, up to date, practical knowledge that people are after. Right. Um, and there wasn't really anything out there on the podcast world for UK travel planning, really. So, so I started it and I dragged Doug into it. <laughs> <laughs> he he's, he's getting better. He's he also gets a little bit nervous when he does a, a podcast episode, but he's getting far better now because you know what? The, you, you don't have to. They don't have to be perfect. People don't expect perfection. Right. That's what my family just kept saying. Have fun with it. Just yeah. be yourself. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is going to be episode 59. I've done 59 episodes. And, you know, and even myself, which people that's think incredible. is a bit strange, I get a little bit nervous every time I do an episode. So, right. you know, and that's me on the 59th episode. And I know I can stop and rewind and we can cut out and stuff, but it's still that I just like, oh, I don't know if it's a bit excitement as well because I love doing them. So yeah, so Doug talk, comes on the podcast, and he'll he t- his speciality is train travel in the UK. So anything with train travel, or he did a recent episode because he did some time he traveled to Wales when we're in the UK, and he, he went to the Isle of Wight. So he did some episodes specifically about those. Right. Yeah. So he, I do more of the talking, but he'll come on when when it's something that I think, oh yeah, it'd be really <laughs> good to get him involved with. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite episode, Deb? Well, I actually learned about Glencoe through the podcast had not heard of Glencoe before. And as soon as I heard you talking about it, I was like, oh, we got to go there. Yeah. And the Caledonian sleeper train was so insightful and so wonderful for us. We were trying to fit so much in such a small period of time that taking the sleeper train back from Scotland to back to London bought us an entire day of travel. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't have to drive that distance back. We could just sleep on the train. It was, that was, just wonderful brilliant brilliant and that was an episode that i dragged doug in to do (laughs) (laughs) you know well we're planning our trip back over this um christmas in january and we've already talked about the caledonian sleeper and because for me and obviously i mean i've traveled all over the world but but you know catching the caledonian sleeper sleeper from london on on nighttime and waking up in scotland particularly when you go to fort william it's just for me it's like heaven i absolutely love it There's something magical about it. And I wanted to make sure to give, especially our children, that was going to be an experience that I knew they would carry for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. I'm so grateful we did that. So I was just thinking, Deb, now we're kind of a few minutes into the podcast and you've asked me a a, a few questions about, about myself and the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about who you went on the trip with and uh, where you live in the States? (laughs) Yes, my name is Deb Blazer, and we're from Florida, the United States. We live on a berry island just south of St. Augustine, and St. Augustine's actually our oldest city. It was founded in 1565, um, so we have a fort up there, and it's 300 years old, which is nothing. It doesn't even compare to how old everything is in England and Scotland. Um, so we were we were excited to get out and see the history. And this was your first trip, was that right, a- a- abroad? Out of- this is our first trip outside of the United States. Yeah. Um, I've gone myself. I went to Canada once and down to the Bahamas, but this was our first family trip out of the U.S. My, my s- oldest son and I were actually supposed to go to Japan this summer. We were s- signed up, scheduled to go to Japan with the school, and he's actually in an um, accelerated program that's actually run out of Cambridge. Um, oh, wow. They do testing into the summertime. And when the, when the kids agree to be part of this program, they sign papers saying they will be there for the tests. And so his test conflicted with our Japan trip. Uh. So we ended up canceling that back in March. And I said to them, I said, to, I got gathered the family and I said, look, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> 
I don't care where we are going somewhere because I think I've, I've talked to you before. We, we have a, um, we have a business that we run from our home. My husband and I work together. So yeah. you know how it is. You never get away from work. Yeah, absolutely. The only way to get away from work is to travel. Yeah. For you, travel is work, but. Yeah. <laughs> fun work, fun work when it is work. Yeah. <laughs> I like that kind of work. <laughs> So I said, we we need to go somewhere. And I asked the kids where they wanted to go. And the first thing they said is, let's go to England and Scotland. Yeah. And I said, okay, let's do it. And um, my maiden name is Baird. We're originally, my ancestors are originally from Scotland. And so I always, it was always a place I wanted to visit. So we yeah. knew that we wanted to include where the Baird clan was in our travels. That was very important. Um, one of the first things I did was sit down and just start looking at geography and mapping out distances. Because being from the U.S., you have no idea how long it takes to drive from London to Scotland. Absolutely. And that's a really smart move. And that's something we kind of recommend that people do. Like Once you've got an idea of where you want to go is map it out. Yeah. Because that's the best way to then start planning from that point in terms of logistics from getting from those you know, A to B to C to D and how you're going to fit them into the time frame that you had. So you were, you were over in the UK in June. So um, not yes. too long ago. So how long were you in there altogether? We did 12 days. I would have rather have done 14, but my, my oldest son's a homebody and he said, I'll give you 12. Right. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. And that's where I said the Caledonian sleeper train really was so helpful and being able to fit in everything we wanted to do. Yeah. The other thing, it was a whirlwind. I mean, we, we covered nearly 2000 miles and we didn't stop. We, we stayed, there were two times we stayed in the same place two nights in a row. Yeah. Other than that, we were on the move. So we packed very light. Um, like I said, we're a family of five and we have, it's my husband and myself. Um, our 16-year-old, we have a 14-year-old boy, and then we have a five-year-old daughter. Yeah. It was a family of five, and we fit us into three suitcases. Excellent. Well done. They were medium-sized suitcases, yep. and then everyone had a backpack. Perfect. Perfect. We knew we had to go from, we had to be able to travel yeah. and move easily. Yeah. And the more that you have, the harder it gets, because the more that you're worried about, and the more you're thinking about, and you're like, what, where's that bag? Where's this bag? And then especially because you were doing a lot of moving, you know, one night here and two, maximum, as you say, maximum two nights and only a couple of places, you didn't want to be unpacking loads of bags every night. It's just right. You know, one thing that I got from the podcast and the Facebook group was, um, do the, the compression bags. Yeah for packing. That was brilliant. So good. I was able to pack complete outfits and then I just labeled them. This is Tuesday. This is Wednesday. It was perfect, especially with the five-year-old. I just put her clothes and my clothes together and yeah. we were ready to go. Perfect. perfect. They're brilliant. I, I use compression bags this year and I've always used packing cubes, but compression bags, wow. You could just fit so much more in as well. So you can... Oh, it was great. It push was great. Down. It's great. It's just obviously the weight. I, I, I came back from the UK with my usual 23 kilograms on the dot. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you get around? I guess that's the next question I want to ask. We knew we wanted to basically do a road trip. Yeah. Another thing that the Facebook group and the podcast taught me was make sure you book an automatic vehicle because everything just defaults to manual, which my husband was, when I originally booked the car, he said, oh, I can handle it. I'll be fine. I can drive manual. I said, honey, you've got enough to worry about. You're just, let's rebook it book the automatic and have one less thing to worry about. Absolutely. And we're so grateful we did. 100%. We, <laughs> yes. We flew into Gatwick and rented our car there and drove into London. I do not recommend this. No. You're very <laughs> I, brave. We, I would not do that. I've, I used to live in London and drive in London and I, I, I wouldn't do that. But, but Oh my gosh. You survived. <laughs> We survived, but by the time we made it to the hotel that night, our plane was running late. We finally got the car worked out, and we got to London, and we got to the hotel, and I just turned to my husband, and I said, I don't think we can do this. I was like, we have to turn around and go home. We can't do this. This is this is too hard. Oh. So, but we got, the, we, we got some sleep. The next day, we felt better, and um, we kind of got in our groove. 
And, but for the first couple of days, every little accomplishment felt like the biggest win. It was like, okay, we got from point A to point B. Yay, go us. <laughs> and I also recommend if you're going to drive, make sure you have one person driving and one person navigating. Absolutely. I had made an entire music Spotify list to listen to in the car. I was going to basically play a whole bunch of old bands and, and teach the kids what real music is. Uh, <laughs> and we didn't listen to any of it because I was navigating and my husband was driving and I was looking at the at Google Maps the whole time going, okay, honey, there's a sharp right up here. You're going to yeah. need to slow down. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's that's really good to do. And I know I know you didn't do the Tripyamo um resource, but I know you kind of regretted it afterwards. So Yes, I wish we would have done that because we just threw ourselves right into it and it was that was that was rough. <laughs> yeah, scary. So so where did you go? Give us tell us tell us your itinerary. Well, the first day we we drove into London and we stayed right out of right outside of King's Cross. We were right there. Yeah. Um, and then the next day we took a Golden Tours day tour from London to Windsor, Stonehenge and Bath because I wasn't going to go to England and not go to Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. That was not happening. And it was such a diff such a diff distance to travel that I, I didn't want to have to drive that part. OK. Yeah. So and I figured I thought we'll be tired from from flying over because you don't you don't sleep on planes. No, not very well. <laughs> so I figured that day we could take this day tour and kind of relax a little bit. And Windsor was just getting out of London and getting to Windsor was like a brush. It was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. And it was so absolutely picture perfect. It was gorgeous. And I would have loved to do Windsor Castle, but it was closed that day because the Royal Ascot was starting the, oh. the following day. Yeah. So the Royal family was actually coming in pretty much right after we were in town. And it was, but as my oldest son said, it was really neat to be in Windsor with, with them preparing for the arrival of the Royal family. Okay, cool. And just to see how all that went down and see all the people lining the streets in their Sunday best and the guards and there were news reporters and it, it, the whole town was just buzzing. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. We'll do Windsor Castle next trip. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. But bus tours are a whirlwind. It's yeah. go, go, go. You have you have an hour to get out and run and go see what you want to see and then you have to be back on the bus. <laughs> yeah, it's very but like it's I said. Very rushed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But I felt like that was the only way we were going to get to see those things. So yeah. we kind of did a trade off and said, Okay, let's do that. Yeah. The other thing with bus tours is make sure you bring food and water for yourself because there's not time to get anything. Yeah. We learned that from the first tour. There's you barely have time to grab food. And if you're grabbing food, you're missing, you're not seeing things. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. Because obviously there's quite, there could be quite long queues in the cafes and these places to get food, so. Exactly, because everyone's on a bus tour. <laughs> exactly, and then you, you know when the bus tour's in town because the queue in the cafe is out the door and you're like, oh no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it's, it's, bus tours are, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them. It was great. We wouldn't have gotten to see those things without it, but I feel like I barely saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Felt it was a bit. It was a bit rushed. Um, and then so you went. You went to your store, Stonehenge. Did you go to Bath? Did you stay on that as well? Yes. So that is a lot. Yeah, my oldest son's very interested in the Roman history of England, so yeah. we kind of focused on some of that, and I wanted to make sure he got to Bath and yeah. saw the Roman baths. Okay, so you, you actually got to go in and see them. Yes, we did. We did. It was I. I wanted to go see the cathedral, but everyone else wanted to go see the Roman baths. So. Oh well, the baths and the abbey are kind of—they're right next to each other. But the, yeah. the Roman baths are amazing. I, I just took my mom a couple of well last month for her birthday, and um, it's the first time she'd been to see the Roman baths. And um, we went into the abbey as well, but she she absolutely loved it. She she raving about it. We have nothing like that in the United States. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's interesting. It's it's just it's a once in a lifetime thing. Absolutely. So then, so that was a day trip. So then you got back into, you got back into London. Back in London and we got the car. Yeah. And drove 
away from London, <laughs> which was a happy day. <laughs> I love London, but I just don't want to drive in it ever again. And no, I don't. Honestly, I we highly recommend to people that they don't. It's just not you've got it. You've got a congestion charge as well when you're driving in London. It's stressful in London if you don't know. You know if you're driving on the different side of the road than you used to anyway. That's massively stressful. But I drive on the left hand, I left hand side all the time, and I would not drive in London again. I've done it in the past before when I lived there, and honestly, I was like, no, nope, never doing this again. Yeah, there's nowhere to park anyway, so no, there's no. no point in it. <laughs> no, it, it, you just waste a lot of time actually because you're just sitting in a car. It, so you're better yeah. off literally. And the subway system is so easy, easy and cheap. My kids loved it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we we did have a little bit of a glitch when we first used the subway because we didn't understand that everyone needed a unique credit card. And having kids, we had. I ended up just getting day passes for them. Yeah, and yeah. It, that worked really well. Okay, well, because you weren't in London a huge amount of time as, as well, so right. I guess that, that worked easier for you. So, so you, you drove out of London and then you headed north? Yes, we went to Warwick Castle, which yep. it's, my son said it's better than Disney World. <laughs> he loved it. Warwick Castle is amazing. It, it was always the destination that I'd take my daughter in the, in the school holidays because they do so much for kids. It's so it's so great. And it's it's like a big Renaissance festival in a castle. And my son loves the trebuchet and they fire the trebuchet and he thought that was amazing. And it was just for for our first castle, it really set the bar high. Yeah. <laughs> did you stay near Warwick for, for the evening or did you continue driving? We were on we were at Stoke on Trent. We traveled up to Stoke on Trent and stayed at Caverswall Castle. Okay. Um, because I wanted to stay in a couple castles. So yeah. we had a turret at Caverswall Castle up there. And then the next morning, and this is another thing where I I like I said, I started planning probably late March, early April. If I would have had more time, I would have been able to better plan this. But we wanted to get to Bolton Castle and do their falconry. Yeah. Which starts at 9 a.m., which is three hours away from Stoke-on-Trent. Yeah. We were up at 530 in the morning and on the road again. <laughs> um, but we knew we wanted to do the falconry because that's that's something you don't do in the United States. They just don't have anything like that. Okay. And it's something that I've always personally been in, interested in. I wanted to give that experience to my boys. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was amazing because you you imagine when a bird, when a big bird is flying and landing on you, you kind of I always thought you had kind of had to brace for it. But they they land so lightly. Yeah. So you just stand thing. there. <laughs> so that was that was an amazing experience. And Bolton Castle is just picture perfect, beautiful. It is a gorgeous castle, and the history with um, how Mary Queen of Scots was held there, and it was just that Bolton Castle. I think so far, maybe my favorite castle that okay. we that we went to. Yeah, I just loved it. And you stayed in Yorkshire that night, didn't you? In a in a cottage. We went up to yes, we went up to Northumberland to uh, oh, Northumberland. Yeah, we drove we drove up through the Yorkshire Dales, which yeah. are amazing. Yeah, saw yeah. so many sheep. We stopped counting, uh, <laughs> and they really are on the road. You oh, honestly yeah, you have do careful. have to watch for them. <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful. And and I'm really pleased with the next bit because you you went up to the the part of the UK that I'm from. So you went up to Northumberland, which is great. Yes, yeah, so I was gonna. That's one thing I wanted to ask you is where exactly are you from? Okay, so um, I'm originally from a place called Seaton Delaville, which is on the coast. Okay. So near Whitley Bay, which it's so it's really on that kind of that the Northumberland coast itself. But my father was from Wall's End, which I, I guess you can tell is from the end of the wall. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, and I was actually born very close to the wall, it, further into Northumberland. I won't say other podcasts because you don't want to say where you were actually born, but. <laughs> It was a, a a major town on along Hadrian's Wall, put it that way. Um, so yeah, I was born there fifty <coughs> something years ago. So I I absolutely adore Hadrian's Wall. It's fantastic. This uh, my sister still lives um, in 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 the it's the same town or village where where we grew up, and um, so we we always do trips out to go and see the wall. And um, we went to Housesteads and Vindolanda second time. I was there last mm. year as well. And I know you went to Housesteads, didn't you? Yes, we actually didn't get to 
to go through the fort. Um, we went we went to Vindolanda first and yep. took all of our time there, <laughs> and then went to Halsteeds and the Wall. And by the time we got there, it was closing. But we got to walk the Wall, which was oh, one yeah. thing my son wanted to do. And as soon as we were up there on the Wall and in that space both my boys turned to each other and said, we're coming back and we're hiking the entire wall. Oh, fantastic. Fabulous. So I, I they'll be back in a couple of years when they yeah. get a little bit older to yeah. hike the entirety of the wall because oh. it was just, it was peaceful and stunning and amazing. And it, we just loved it. But I also have to give a shout out to um, Janet. She runs an Airbnb and they have the cutest little garden cottage and lovely little dog and to this day, when I ask my five-year-old, what was your favorite part of the trip? She says the dog. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it was just, she was absolutely w- wonderful. She hand homemade, gave us homemade um, granola bars that we took with us yeah. and ate on for the next couple of days as we traveled. And she was just absolutely lovely it ties into exactly what i was saying at the beginning about it's the people yes oh my you gosh these yes. amazing places but also those people you know, those people that you meet that make it so special don't they they do and it's it's it was i'm so glad we got out into the country and got to talk to people and meet people and really see the countryside and see how everyone lives that was that was the best part of the trip I think that's important, and I do try to encourage people to 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 do that. Get out of London, stay in London. I mean, you know, explore London is is fantastic, but to actually kind of get get to know uh, the country, you have to get out of London. My thought process of getting out of London too was that's going to be home base. We're always going to probably fly in and out of there. Yeah. So over time, we can catch all the London sites as we come back time and again because you. You don't go to England and Scotland just once. No. <laughs> once you're there, you fall absolutely in love with it and you go back. It's true. You know, we do we do itinerary consults. And um, this year we're actually doing second time round itinerary consults for quite a number of people we did itinerary with last year who are also returning back to the UK this year. Yeah. So it's really nice. So, yes, next we drove up to Scotland um, and we stayed in this little apartment in Edinburgh. Um, just one night because you know that's how we roll Mm -hmm. um so the next morning we actually i was under the impression that there was parking by edinburgh castle there's not we drove up there and we had to be up our our appointment time was 9 30 and we drove up there and it took us an hour to find parking and by the time we got up to the castle, it was 10, 30, 11 o'clock, but they were so kind and they let us in and said, oh, don't worry about it. And um, so we didn't we didn't have as much time at Edinburgh Castle as I had hoped. Yeah. And it was raining and it was crowded. So we we kind of we saw the the crown jewels and did a couple of things. And then we took off because I also wanted to hit Balmoral that day. Yeah. yeah. So we had to drive clear up to Balmoral. Um, we ended up getting up there. It was nearly five o'clock. Right. It, was around, it was around four. And they said, go in the castle and talk to the people. And we ended up talking to this lovely lady that worked there. We, Oh, my gosh. We talked to her. We talked to her until it was closing time. <laughs> wow. She was just full of information. And, yeah. she, oh, she was wonderful. But then they said, you know, the grounds don't close. So feel free to wander around. So. Because we got there so late, we were the only people on the grounds of Balmoral. Wow. It was, that was really amazing. Um, and I kept telling my daughter, I said, you're playing where real princes and princesses play. So then after Balmoral, where did you head? Uh, we, we went up to Elgin and stayed in a castle gatehouse up in Moray. Right. Um, one of the coolest things about this place is every morning and we stayed there for two nights and it was wonderful and every morning and every evening usually around five in the morning and around seven eight o'clock at night a pheasant would come into the yard to eat from the bird feeder so i i've i dubbed him lord elgin lord lord elgin of moray yeah (laughs) And he would come visit us every day. So the ne- next day, we drove out to Penin, which is where my ancestors are from. Right. 
Um, at one point, the Bairds apparently had a castle up there somewhere, but I believe it was it was pretty much in ruin. And then in the 1980s, I think they just got rid of it. Right. But in our ancestral lore, they actually speak of the Cliffs of Pennon. So we definitely wanted to go there. And another thing I was really grateful for was on the way to Pennon, it was kind of an easy day. We stopped at an antique store in Cullen. Because I, I knew I wanted to pick up souvenirs, but I also wanted to get some really cool, authentic, old things, mm-hmm. um, especially for my close family members. I wanted to make sure I didn't want to bring them home a magnet. Yeah. I wanted to bring them home something thoughtful and special. Um, so we stopped in an antique place and talked to everyone there. And it was actually it's actually owned by a man and his grandfather. His father or his grand I think it's his father. Um, and we were talking to them. I started talking to his father because his father sneezed. And I said, oh, bless you. And he said, thousands wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed. I, was, I said, I got to talk to you. You're interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at one point, his his son turns to me and he says, are you driving? And I said, no. I said, my husband's driving. And he said, you need a shot of real Scottish whiskey and I said okay it's two o'clock in the afternoon sure (laughs) well and ironically I had woken up that day with a headache and I and he he said oh don't worry this will take care of your headache so I had a grand day it was great (laughs) sounds it it. so what did you buy I have to ask what you bought uh I got a, uh, a toothpaste container from the Victorian era it's a little ceramic toothpaste jar Mm -hmm. um and I got my mom a little pewter box my brother because he he feeds the squirrels around his house so I got him I found him a little pewter squirrel um and my sister loves Winnie the Pooh so I got her um an antique ceramic Winnie the Pooh frame oh cute and some other little things oh I had gotten um a foundry a a metal foundry sign from Aberdeen. That was one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was um, I took a journal with me thinking that I would have time to journal on my trip. Yeah, I didn't have time to journal. <laughs> so what we ended up doing was we would pick flowers. Ah, oh, good idea. And plants from everywhere we went. And we basically just used it as a, as a flower press. Yeah, yeah. So now we have we can go back in and we oh we got those we got that flower from Hadrian's Wall and we got those from Balmoral and we have all these flowers that we collected on our journeys. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Though. And then after that, you went to Sky. I know you went to Sky, didn't you? You went to the Isle of Sky and, and then, yeah. Yes. We really quickly, if anyone has a chance to go to Pennon, Pennon was yeah. amazing. It was this little fishing village and there were probably 20 to 30 houses and down this huge cliff. And I honestly don't know how these people get out in the winter time. They're just stuck there. I don't know. (laughs) They'll probably grit the road so that they'll put salt on. That'd be the only way I would imagine. It was absolutely gorgeous though. I'm so glad we went there. And then we took off the next morning. We stopped. I kind of added Elgin cathedral and late. Yeah, because I realized that we had to be out of the castle gatehouse at 10 a.m., but we could not check into our room at the Highland Club until 4 p.m. And I think there was maybe two to three hours driving time. So we had some time to kill. Um, So I found I found Elgin Cathedral, which was just absolutely stunning. It that was gorgeous, gorgeous ruins. And then we also stopped at Brody Castle because they have the coolest play garden. And with a five-year-old, yeah. even the big kids were playing. They were rolling yeah. down the hill too. They all had a blast. But it, it was good to just let them run off some steam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they did well because you, you're doing a lot of um, car travel. So, yeah. My our five year old was a trooper. She walked up and down all those castle stairs like nobody's business. Brilliant. You don't realize how how tight and I mean some of the castle stairs you're walking on ruined castle stairs that they were they were half 
halfway up her shin for each stair. And she would, everyone was so patient with her and she was up and down those stairs and (laughs) she did really well. (laughs) So then what you stayed, you stay in the Highland Club that night and then next day, um, did you take a tour from them there from the Alice to the Alice Sky? Yeah. We stayed at the Highland Club because when else are you ever going to get the chance to stay at an old abbey on Loch Ness? That was just, <laughs> that was something. Yeah. And then the next day we took a day tour out to Isle of Skye because once again, I knew we were doing so much driving and Isle of Skye was going to, it's another two to three hours out. And I thought, mm, let's just take a bus tour and give ourselves a break. Yeah, don't blame me. So we went with Luke. He calls himself Luke Skywalker. It's <laughs> Luke.tours is his Instagram. Yeah. And he was amazing. Really personable guy. He knew I, he taught us so much about the Jacobite Rebellion and all of that and yeah. Isle of Sky and it was just it was a good time um we ended up having really good weather he said a lot of times when you go out there you don't see as much because it gets really overcast Mm -hmm. but we had a beautiful day and you could see you could see everything you could see all the mountains it was gorgeous the next day we drove and and this is where like i cannot stress enough to people to stay flexible because i wanted to go to the glenfinnan viaduct so badly yeah but it would have added another two hours driving time and by that point we were we were spent yeah and i just said okay nix that forget that let's just make sure we get to glencoe um both our boys are are big monty python fans so we had to go to castle stalker and see that (laughs) and if you're at castle stalker i don't remember the name of the place but up on the hill right you could there's a view of the castle and there's this wonderful little cafe i had the most amazing garden salad and it sounds ridiculous because you're thinking how can garden salad be amazing but it it was so good and they had the best coffee oh my gosh oh that's good that's good and did what did you think of glencoe because obviously that's somewhere that i i because i love glencoe i just think it's so beautiful my younger son says that he's going to live there someday <laughs> he he loved it he it was raining the day we were there so we ended up pulling off and there was this waterfall on the hillside and my son wanted to do a little bit of hiking so we hiked up to the waterfall while my husband stayed in the car with the little one and he kept saying oh can't we just get out and hike and I said your sister's five years old we can't be running her all over the mountainside in the rain. I was like, this just, we can't, I'm really sorry. Oh, well, you'll have to go back. Definitely. Yes. Yes. He's, he loved Glencoe was his favorite to ask him what his favorite part of the trip was. Glencoe hands down, loved it. He just wanted to hike all over those Hills. (laughs) They're very popular thing to do. Absolutely. And then, uh, so after you, you went to Castle Stalker and then you went down to drop the car back off it? Yes, but first we stopped at Doan Castle. Yes, oh yes. Um, very quickly because of Monty Python. We had to go there too. Yep. And then we drove down to Glasgow and dropped the car and waited on the sleeper train, which was an experience. It's it's very small. The rooms are mm-hmm. Absolutely tiny, which I knew to expect. I, I listening to your podcast, and I kept telling my husband, I said, "You need to pa- you need to pack an overnight bag because you're not going to be able to get in the suitcase." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you've got what you need. <laughs> yeah, he didn't believe me, right. and then we got on, and he said, "Oh, yeah, there really isn't room here." <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been telling you. <laughs> that's what honestly, the podcast and the Facebook group had me so well prepared and there were of course there's still surprises but I knew about turning switches on and off for outlets and ovens and I wouldn't have known that um I knew that there weren't outlets in the bathrooms Mm -hmm. I knew that there was an AC things like that that I could prepare for I think it was um it was one of the podcasts right before we left I was listening to and somebody mentioned that there weren't outlets in the bathrooms and I said, oh, my gosh, OK, I need to grab a, a some sort of little standing mirror so that I can fix my hair in the hallway. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, quite often you'll find mirrors in in on in the halls anyway, or in, yes. in hotel bedrooms and stuff anyway. Because, um, yeah, that it's not allowed for uh, building regulations or safety regulations. Um, that they're not not allowed to have um, the electric outlets near water. Um, it seems to catch a lot of people from around the world by surprise. But um, that's I guess when you grow up in the UK, you don't know any different. So you could, I, I get a bit of a surprise when I do see electric in, in battery. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay yeah <laughs> it was it was just it was so it was so comforting to be prepared for those sorts of things and not be surprised by them and that's the I mean we had enough surprises on day two right before we left London our luggage broke oh yes my son had brought a full breastplate and back plate of armor in the luggage and I don't I don't think the luggage like that Um, (laughs) so day two our suitcase busts open um but we we went to Tesco and got a new suitcase and I actually picked up a little suitcase just for souvenirs you know so you arrived back in London and you spent uh, a day or so in London before you flew back to the states is that right yes we 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 called it our London pickup day because our plane was late getting there. We had hoped to go to Tower of London the day we arrived. I had high hopes that got dashed repeatedly. You have to go with it. It's trouble. <laughs> I was trying to fit everything in. Um, so we ended up going to Tower of London on our London pickup day. Went there first thing. One thing I would do differently in the future going back is look into the UK heritage passes. We had no idea how many heritage sites we would end up visiting and we would have saved so much. You would have saved a lot of money actually. And we we do have an article about those because we, uh, you know, Doug and I have, we have uh, national trust, we have English heritage, we have historic, we have all of them, I think, Um, because it just is just so useful when you're back to save, to save money. Um, So I will put a link to the article for anybody who's going over who who wants to know a bit more about that. Because yeah, you did visit a lot of places that it probably would have added up. Yeah. You don't realize how many places you're going to go that, take those sorts of things Mm -hmm. until you're there and they're asking you and you're going, no, I don't have it. (laughs) But we, we just, we, we said, you know what? It's, it's a donation to these wonderful places and their upkeep. Did you go to museums in London? I saw the national natural history. We did. We went to the natural natural history museum in London. And we also went to the national museum of Scotland when we were up in Edinburgh. Yeah. My oldest son wants to be a paleontologist. So we tend to go see dinosaur bones any chance we get. So <laughs> oh, perfect. Natural History Museum is perfect for that. <laughs> yeah. They have a great exhibition. We did Tower of London in the morning and then we did the Natural History Museum in the afternoon. So it was a good day. And then we flew back home the next day. <laughs> wow. So it was a really was a whirlwind twelve twelve days or yeah, you had you you really packed it in. You had a busy busy time um but it'll be uh, i'll we will include kind of we'll do a bit of a write-up of your itinerary because we're putting some itineraries together at the moment because mm. we get asked about driving road trips around the uk and we're, we're sitting talking about this today other day saying we actually need to put some together so i'll i'll um i'll use yours as well if you don't mind and put that in we'll do it in the show notes anyway but i'll include it absolutely you know it works you did it it, it is a busy one the good thing about it being so fast paced is i felt like we were we were in it. We were just in it, live in the moment. And my kids didn't pick up any kind of digital device the entire time. The only thing was when we were driving, our our five-year-old would watch Bluey on her little tablet, but that's it. Yeah. We didn't even watch TV the entire time. No TV, no devices. I mean, we were just, we were in it. Yeah, you were. Yeah. I don't know if it would be the same if we, if we weren't, going at the pace that we were yeah so I'm grateful I'm grateful we did it now with the kids kind of leads me into the last question which is the question that I ask everybody is what is the one tip that you would give to anybody planning a trip to the UK for the first time I would say the most important thing is to really search your soul and consider what you want to get out of your trip that's going to dictate how you plan um the other thing is to just be flexible. When your suitcase falls apart in the parking lot, go get another one. Yeah. 
don't let it ruin your trip. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Perfect advice. And I think in, in this day and age, we, we, you have to just have that ability to kind of roll with things when things don't quite work out exactly as you kind of hope they're going to do, because things always go wrong. Oh, absolutely. But um, I want to say thanks so much, Deb, for coming on to, uh, can I call you Deb? Or is it Deborah? Absolutely. Thank you. This has been an honor. Thank you so much. And I'm going to continue to listen to the podcast because I love it. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the UK Travel Planner Podcast. Information on all the places Deborah mentioned, plus links to relevant resources, can be found at uktravelplanning.com forward slash episode 59. If you've enjoyed this episode, you can support our work via the Tip Your Guide button, which can be found on the website, or you can even become a sponsor of the podcast for as little as three US dollars a month. More information about that can also be found on the podcast in the show notes. Um, we love having sponsors. We love it when people um, support our work. It really helps us and we really, really appreciate it. And also you can get a shout out on the podcast too. Anyway, that just leaves me though for this week to say happy UK travel planning. Thank you.